I get to have all these acronyms after my name. Um, for my day job, I work as the global uh, product security architect for Schneider Electric. You might have heard of Schneider before. We, um, we, we do everything from the little battery backups that you put under your desk to plug your computer into. The, this is APC, that's our stuff. Electrical panels, so the Square D electrical panels and switches and everything, those, that's our company. Um, we also do industrial automation, so we, if you have a refinery, we're the ones that are doing the automation for the refinery. The, the liquid level gets too high or too hot, then our control, control systems will handle that. We do dams, uh, electrical grid stuff, uh, uh, oil rigs, basically anything, and it's all kind of this critical infrastructure stuff that, that the bad guys are trying to hack to turn off our electrical grid and that sort of thing. So that's what I do every day is to try and make sure the bad guys keep can't interrupt our life. Um, but I'm also very interested in cybersecurity for, for individuals and that's why I'm here to figure I could maybe help out a little bit. So why are seniors targets? Well, um, seniors are typically typically not at the at the top of, of the understanding of, of uh, technology. Technology moves really, really fast, and unless you're paying attention, you're missing things and, and it's getting out of uh, reach for you. I'm 59 years old now and it's starting to happen to me, so I totally get it. And I'm still in the industry. Um, so there are a lot of things that are going on that ways in which you can be scammed that you wouldn't even dream of. Um, also, Seniors typically uh, are on a fixed income, and, and to an outsider, that's a, that's, a, that's a big bunch of money, but you gotta make that last a lot of years. And so it makes you a target because you have resources, and, and they wanna take away your resources. They're much less likely to scam my 18-year-old daughter, for example, who doesn't have two nickels to rub together. So that's, that's another reason that you're a target. Um, also, uh, typically, Typically, uh, it's, it's easier to give in to fear when you're not understanding what's going on or, or they use big words, they, they say things that, that are, make it very easy to frighten you into giving up whatever it is they're trying to get. So that's why seniors are targets. And it's, uh, it's a sad truth, but, but it is in, in fact the truth. So, so let's talk about some of the common scams. Now, there are a million scams out there and every day you hear about a new one. Uh, but we'll talk about some of the common ones, the ones that, you're, that are most likely to, to affect you. Um, ultimately, the, 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 uh, the punchline for all this is use, your, use a gut check. If it doesn't seem right, it probably isn't. So we have this thing called phishing with a pH. I'm not quite sure why it's a pH. I think it has something to do with old, uh, the old times when they were, uh, when they were manipulating the telephone system. They call that freaking, P-H-R-E-A. And what they would do is they would, punt, they would put tones into the telephone and it would instruct the telephone system to do things for it. When you put a coin into a payphone, for example, it hits bells a certain way, ding, 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 and they know that it was a quarter that went in there. So the little bit of low-tech kind of ways that the system worked, um, they learned how to manipulate that, where they could put in key codes or, or touch tones that don't actually exist on a normal keyboard, that instructs the system. And so they were doing that to give themselves free phone calls and that sort of thing. But phishing is how we do when we steal information by email. So usually, um, I'm about to sneeze, so if you'll excuse me a second. They're usually trying to pretend to be somebody else. You'll get an email from Microsoft or your electric utility or your phone company or something like that. And, and if you look very, very carefully, um, you're going to find that, uh, that uh, I'll sneeze eventually. Ah, I feel so much better. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, so they'll usually be trying to pretend to be somebody else. And if you look at where the email's from, you'll see it doesn't make sense. It doesn't come from Eversource.com or Unitil.com or whatever the company is. It has some other email address on there. So that's your first sign. Um, uh, they'll also have kind of, kind of a sense of urgency. They'll say, for example, your bill is overdue and you're going to be shut off at 5 p.m. today unless you click here to rectify your account. So it's always, almost always a sense of urgency. They're trying to frighten you. And if you don't take action right now, then, then by golly, your bad things are going to happen. 
Um, um, sometimes they'll, 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 it'll look very, very legitimate. Um, uh, and if you click one of these things, which I recommend you don't do, if you click one of these things, it'll go to a website that looks pretty much legitimate. What they'll do is they'll basically copy the official website, then they'll make theirs look just like it, but instead of having the real company behind it, they'll be um, trying to steal your information. Um, so sometimes if you, if you click there and you say, oh, gee, I have to log into my, uh, my uh, electric utility account or something, you click on that thing and it asks you for your username and your password. And a lot of people have their passwords in a book and they'll punch in their username, they'll punch in their password that's written down in the book. And, uh, and, and it'll fail and you say, oh, I must have typed it poorly, so I'm gonna try again. The page then secretly goes off to the, to the real website, which looks the same. It's just a flash, you don't even notice. You punch in your username and your password and it works. But the first time it didn't work, they were just harvesting your password. Now they know your username and they know your password. That's how they get access to these things. Um, so they end up with your password. So that's phishing. So how do we identify the fake emails? So I said, like I said, look at the return address. It's, it's oftentimes will will uh, will be a phony address and it won't be what you expect it to be. So that's your first thing. Um, sometimes they'll say something like, dear customer or dear user or dear, and it'll be like your last name or something, uh, or your email address <coughs> or something like that. It will not say, you know, uh, uh, dear uh, uh, Frank Lembry, uh, uh, here's your here's information on your on your uh, account and this sort of thing. It'll be very generic because they don't have that information about you. Sometimes they will, but oftentimes the only thing they have is your email address. Uh, there'll be no account number on that, or if there is an account number, it's fake. Um, typically, these scams run out of foreign countries where English is a second language. And so their grammar is going to be terrible. Their spelling is going to be horrendous. And, and if you were a teacher, you would be there with a the red pen circling it all over the place, right? Um, they will create a sense of urgency. They will create threatening language sometimes. They will say, uh, we're from the IRS, and we're going to have you arrested if you don't respond, right? And that, that puts fear in you, right? Um, if you know that this is a scam and you, you have a, the, the attitude that this is probably a scam, then you're not panicked and you're like, eh, delete and done. Um, they will sometimes have attachments. Click here to download the new update or something like that. You click that thing and, and uh, if you're lucky, your software will catch it and say, this might be bad stuff, do you really want to run it? If you say yes, then they'll essentially own your computer They'll have full access to everything on it. And so this is what we want to avoid. Avoid the fake emails, and here's the way you try to find them. And again, it, it, what I call is the, the smell test. Check your gut. Does it seem right? If it doesn't seem right, I always guarantee you it's not. So then there's vishing. So let's say you don't ever get on a computer. As I'm told, you never do. <laughs> I don't. Okay, so, so um, uh, vishing is, is the same as phishing, but it's by voice, and that's why it's got a V at the beginning of it. Um, sometimes their caller ID will look legitimate. It might say something electric utility or something gas company or uh, uh, rhymes propane or something like that. And the caller ID will look accurate. Remember we talked about um, the, the phone freaking before? One of the things they can do is they can fake up the caller ID. So the caller ID should never be trusted. It can be faked up. I could, I could call you and make it appear as though I'm calling from the White House. And, and you, you're not the wiser. So the caller ID might be legitimate. Don't be tricked by that. Sometimes they will say things about you that they know. They've collected information about you. They know your address, for example. Now, how is, how is your house? I was by last week. It's a beautiful White House, isn't it, right? And they'll. They, will, they, they can actually find your address and they can look online and see that you've got a white colored house or, or a beige house. You have nice gardens. They'll say something about you to kind of gain your trust. Um, don't, don't fall for that because all this information is easily found. So if I, if I were to pick somebody at random and I were to know your name, I could Google you and I could probably figure out where you live. I could probably look at your house on a map online 
I could, I could find out that you're related to this person or that person. I know all this stuff about you. Um, and they do too. And what they're trying to do is get something that they don't know, like your account numbers. Um, they will sometimes ask for sensitive information. They'll call up and they'll say, hi, we're from the bank. Um, and, uh, and there's been a bit of an issue. But first, I need to verify that I'm talking to the, to the right person. They'll say, can you please tell me your social security number? Can you please tell me your, the, the, the PIN for your, for your ATM card? Tell me uh, your account number or, or what have you. They will ask for that and they'll say, well, we just called you, uh, but we need, need to make sure it's really you. Um, so you need to be very careful of that. They will oftentimes ask for that sensitive information. And if you think about it logically, it's like, well, you just called me. You, why don't you prove who you are? Um, and so, so never give that information out. To say, you know what, you say you're from the bank, thank you very much, I'll call the bank right now. And you get out the phone book and you find the phone number for the bank and you call the bank with the number out of the phone book. Um, sometimes they'll give you a callback number. You'll say, oh, I, I'll call directly and they'll say, oh, can we connect you? Or, oh, um, uh, here's the number to call and they'll give you a bogus number and you're just talking to a different scammer. So always use a phone number to call back that you trust. And then let's say you get a hold of your bank and they say, oh no, we would never ask that information. We'll never ask for personal information over the phone. You know it's a scam and then report it. Tell the bank, this is what happened. This is the phone number that called me. This is what they said. And they will deal with law enforcement to, to bring it to a stop. But only use information that you trust when you're contacting them. Don't take their word for it. Never offer that, that private information, even if they know that you have wonderful tulips in your garden. Then there's smishing and spear phishing. I thought I would mention these just because I think I like saying smishing. But, but a smishing is, is, is like phishing, but it's with, with a text. They'll drop your text and they'll say, uh, uh, your, your eBay account has been suspended. Click here to, to find out why. And you click it and all of a sudden, your phone's been hacked and, and you have concerns. Now that's much more of an issue with Android phones than it is with iPhones, but it's possible to, to damage your phone um, if you click that link. Um, and and if, if it doesn't damage your phone, it'll bring you to an official looking place that will ask for information that they're trying to get out of you. So don't ever click anything. If you don't recognize the caller and they're trying to do something urgently, just ignore it, just delete it. Um, the phones now have got the thing where you can say, uh, it says, this caller is not in your contact list, delete it or report spam and delete it. I always hit the report spam, especially with the political people. Spear phishing, now spear phishing is the, is the person who's, who finds out that you have beautiful tulips in your front bed, right? Um, they know about you, they've done some research on you and they've targeted you. Uh, they've targeted you for who knows what reason, but, but uh, they research you. They try to find out about you. They know that your house is a lovely shade of blue or what have you. It, it, the spear phishing is they're looking for you specifically. They're not dialing randomly. They're calling you specifically. So, so be careful with that. Link clicking, I mentioned this earlier, just don't. If somebody emails you, if you don't know who it was that sent it to you, or it just doesn't seem like the right thing, um, don't click it. Um, one of the things I recommend is to have a garbage email account. Now, my, my garbage email account is meafjm at gmail.com. And that stands for Most Excellent Account for Junk Mail. And anytime I have to sign up for anything, uh, let's, say, let's say I want to win a prize or something. It's something, uh, I go to a home show where they're giving away an RV or something like that. I'll use that. Now, I don't pay attention to the, the email that goes into that. But any mail that goes in there, I know I don't really care about. I reserve my personal email for people I know, so it very much limits the spam that I get. And it makes me less of a target because uh, all the junk mail and, and that sort of thing all goes to the junk mail inbox. So have a garbage email account because then you're much more free to say, delete, 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 delete. And I know this really isn't from you know, Charlie or whoever, right? 
so don't use your favorite email account when you sign up for stuff. Keep that just for people you know. Don't use it just to sign up for things. Don't click in emails or text, and uh, one click can infect everything. And once once they've got their, their hooks into your computer, it's very hard to get those hooks out. This is a good one, the tech support. I'm sure everybody here has gotten one of these calls at one point or another. Hi, we're calling from Microsoft, and there's a problem on your computer, and we want to help you fix it. Microsoft doesn't care about anybody in this room. <laughs> they, they, you, know, you have a problem, they're the last people who are going to help. Um, and the same goes with, same goes with Apple, Rusty. <laughs> Apple will never call you. They will never say, oh, we've, we've detected a problem. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get you to, to give them access to your computer. So it's like, oh, well, there's a problem on my computer. Well, then they're going to help? Sure. So you click OK. Now, now this has happened to some, some very smart people close to me. Not them, but uh, some very smart people close to me who, uh, who were scammed this way um, because they gave in to that sense of urgency and that, you know, oh, something's wrong and you know, I'm just going to make the problem go away and they'll fix it. Um, what they do is they say, okay, I'm going to send you a link, click on that link and run the program. And so you click on the link, you run the program, and what the program does is it gives them full access to everything. They can move the mouse around on your screen, they can copy your files, they can basically do anything you could do physically sitting there in front of the computer and all you can do is watch. Um, so, so never, ever, ever, if anybody calls up and says you have a problem with your computer, hang up. Unless you want to have fun with them. I had a lot of fun with them too. I, I, they, I'm sitting here using a Mac and they're trying to tell me how to do things on Windows. They said, well, go down to the bottom left and click the Windows button. I said, well, I don't see a Windows button there. Oh, it's got to be right that I, I wasted about 45 minutes of their time until they kind of got the, caught on to the fact that either I was on a Mac or I was just messing with them. It, it, it's fun if you've got a spare Saturday afternoon. Um, uh, also, sometimes these folks will say, to try to, make, to try to appear to be legitimate, they'll say, we're willing to fix your computer for $50 or something like that. You, you just give me a credit card number and we'll get it squared away. Sometimes, if it's free, you're more, um, more cautious. But if you're paying for it, then it's a service. And so sometimes they'll collect $50 from you. And then not only do they get your credit card, which they can go off and do things with, um, but, they, but they also then have full access to your computer. So, so why are they doing this? These are, these are people who are, who are making money by selling the credit cards and you get bogus charges and your card gets canceled and you have to wait for a new one and everything. But there are also, um, there are also folks who are funding their entire countries with this and I'll get to that in a little bit. Ransomware. So ransomware is what happens when bad guys get into a computer system. More often than not, they're going after businesses and municipalities. The, um, I just saw a headline in the paper today, in, in the Lowell Sun today, where the, the, the city of Lowell was subject to ransomware. I saw that. Did you? Yeah. yeah. That just happened today. So basically, they hack into the computer. They then encrypt all the data on the computer. So your computer has none of your files anymore, just a whole lot of encrypted things you don't have access to. And if you pay them, let's say, let's say it's a hospital, they'll say, Give us, give us a million dollars and you get it all back. Oftentimes the hospital will pay the million dollars because it's a lot cheaper than rebuilding everything from scratch. That million dollars goes through cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and things like that. And that is how the North Koreans are funding themselves right now. The Russians as well. The Russians are very much into this now because their economy is in a shambles. And, and uh, basically they're, they're stealing from us with <coughs> ransomware. But it can happen to your home computer as well. Uh, oftentimes it's because you clicked on a link and some malware got on there. Malware is what we call software with malicious intent. Um, so malware gets on there, they ask you to pay up. If it's your home computer, they'll probably say, yeah, a thousand bucks. So you can pay them a thousand dollars and frequently, most, most often they will, they will give you all your data back. 
but they could do it again. And I think that they, uh, they, they, they uh, give you all your stuff back because they want to be thought of as good guys who are just looking for money. And if they didn't give it to you back, then nobody would ever pay it. So they have to kind of deliver the goods when they, when they do this. So, um, so backups are, are a big defense against this. If you have backups, and I use, uh, <coughs> what I, what is, what's, the, what's I use? OneDrive, I guess, for, for all my stuff. I push it all off into the cloud, and, and uh, they take care of it and everything. So even if somebody wiped out my computer, I could reinstall my computer, because I know how to do this stuff, but maybe you guys would have to maybe go to like Best Buy or Geek Squad or something, I don't know, but, um, but I, can, I can recover my files that way. So backups are nice, you don't have to, you don't have to pay their thousand dollars or whatever it is. And also there's a lot of protection software that you can get, it's antivirus software you've heard about, and anti-malware software. Many times antivirus and anti-malware will detect what's going on before the damage is done and puts a stop to it. So that it's good stuff to have. I have a question. Yeah. On that anti, uh, what about that PC-Matic I see on TV? Is I, don't, I don't know anything about it. And then there's AVG that keeps popping up on my t on my computer that telling me that I have issues that are, are possible. AVG? Mm -hmm. It's a free download. Mm -hmm. And then after a year or so, and then you got to buy the upgraded. So oh, good grief. Okay. I would, what I would do, I think, in that case, is I would install software that you, that you know. Not, nothing free. Be willing to pay something for it. And it may actually report AVG as a virus. So then, Norton or something like that? Yep, Norton is good. I use the one called Sophos because it runs on both Windows. What is it? S O P H O S. S O P H O S. Okay. I like Sophos because it runs on both Mac and PC. Okay. Um, and I think that's like $100 a year, and I get five computers that are covered. But Norton's a good one as well. I would avoid Kaspersky right now because it's a Russian company and I don't know that their Why intentions. You? Kaspersky? I never heard of that. Okay, good. Well, <laughs> I, 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 I question their motivations <coughs> and, and what they might do if the high party officials ask them to do things. Um, I don't trust them. But. I don't trust any of them. <laughs> How about McAfee? McAfee's good. So let's talk about Facebook. Um, so Facebook is, as I say, not, it's not always your friend. Um, there are quizzes and surveys, and if you follow my mom on Facebook, she, she posts these things occasionally saying, don't, don't do this, don't answer these things. So they'll have these surveys and quizzes, and they'll say, for example, um, what happened on your birthday? You know, what, what famous event happened on your birthday? And you say, well, you know, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Okay, well, now I know your birthday is December 7th. Everybody on the internet now knows what your birthday is. That's a problem. Um, they, will ask, uh, they will ask for, for uh, information about what your middle name might be. The things that would, if you answer the question, you think you're having fun, it's like, oh, my superhero is, you know, such and such. Then they can say, oh, well. That's quite this, common. It is very common. Mm, yeah. But what those people are doing when they post that stuff is they're collecting that information. They know who answered the quiz, they know what the answer was, and now they've got a database of all that information that would be difficult to get otherwise. It's, you know, it's, it's, a temp it's very tempting to want to answer those questions. Yep. Especially if your friends are telling them they can't answer those questions. So, so, now, so, so how do they use this information? Well, they use it in password reset. Uh, oftentimes, it's like, I forgot my password. Okay, well, what was the make of your first car? Okay, they know that now because you told them it was a Buick, right? <laughs> and, and so that's public information now that, that, now that you've given it away. You know, uh, what's your mother's maiden name? On what street did you grow up on? Uh, all these password reset questions, I never answer, I never answer genuinely. I keep a record of what I answer. So I'll say, what street did I, did I grow up on? And I'll say, you know, Marge or something like that. And, but I'll keep track of all that so I can still reset my password. But I use random information in those fields so that people can't guess it. Because 
you know, you, you reach a certain age, there are a lot of people who know a lot of things about you, and they know what street you grew up on, they know what elementary school you went to, all that stuff. They, they, it's very easy to find this out, the more people you know. Some of that stuff shows up on Google. Yep, yeah. absolutely. <clears throat> but if you, if you make up bogus information and put it into those, into those questions, um, it becomes, I won't say impossible. We never speak in absolutes, almost never speak in absolutes in cybersecurity. We never say something's hack proof. Um, but if you, if you do that, if you follow that practice and you write down those answers in your, in your you know, little red password book or what have you, um, they can't get it. They, they can't reset your password. Uh, Facebook games. Everybody likes playing these games on Facebook. Well, Facebook games um, typically will grant the game people access to your contact lists, your birthdays, who your cousins are, all that stuff. All that stuff that Facebook knows, by, by playing that game, oftentimes you're granting them access to all that. Which is why they make the game. They're trying to mine information from you. Who knows what they're going to use it for? It might be just be to, to decide that you're a good target for a timeshare in, in a Boca. It might be that they're trying to, to compile a database to hack you. So avoid those games. So there are impersonation scams as well. There's, um, uh, they'll call up from the saying, hi, you're, we're from the IRS. Uh, uh, the police will be there in a half an hour, but we can uh, we can ask them to stop if you just pay us the thousand dollars you owe us now. We're happy to take a credit card, um, and, and so they'll they'll do that. They'll strike fear into you, and uh, again we have our sense of urgency. Uh, we spoke about we need to verify your identity. Hi, we're from the Social Security Administration, and there's been a mix up with your check, um, but we need to verify who you are first. They know your age because they can they can find all this public information online, right? Um, so they'll verify your identity. They'll say you're going to be arrested. The police are coming and this sort of thing. Um, very very common. Sometimes they'll 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 say, uh, oh well, we can take a gift card. Well, we'd like you to go to the Seven Eleven and buy a hundred dollar gift card for Amazon. And then you run out there and you get it because you're in a panic and you just want to make this go away and. They'll say, okay, now scratch off the information on the back and send us a picture of that. Now what you've just done is you've given them a hundred bucks. By giving them the information, the scratched off information on the gift card, they now own the gift card and they've got money from you. So the gift card scams are very common. Now, if you think about it logically, the phone company is not going to take payment in gift cards. Uh, and uh, uh, so if, if there's gift cards involved, I guarantee you it's a scam. So they'll impersonate anybody, your, like I say, the electric company, the, the oil company. Ah, sometimes they'll say, they'll say, congratulations, you've been chosen at random. Look, it's all, it's all one dollar bills. It must have been a really cheap, yeah. must have been a really cheap. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping for some Benjamins in there, but. But they'll, they'll, they'll call up and they'll say, hi, you, you just won a lottery, and, you, and you're like thinking to yourself, well. When the heck did I enter a lottery? You know, and they might say, oh, but it was at a home show last year. It was at the RV show in Boston in January. All right, maybe maybe I did. Um, but great. And then they'll say, oh, just, to, just to, uh, to make sure we're getting it to the right person, we need you to send us some money. And you'll get it back. But you know, in order to win that, that $100,000 uh, RV, we need to have uh, $1,000 to cover taxes or, or some, some phony baloney thing like that. They'll get you to give them the money, credit card or, uh, or uh, gift cards or, or a check or what have you, and, uh, and then they'll, they'll say you'll get it back. Um, but absolutely, this should be sending off the alarm bells as, as if somebody says you've magically won something. Uh, I'm not that lucky, so anytime anybody says I've won anything, I'm uh, <laughs> immediately... Uh, alerted. The grandparent scams. They'll call in the deep dark of the night and they'll say, oh, this is, uh, this is your, your niece, uh, so-and-so, or maybe they actually have the name. And they'll say, oh, yeah, geez, you know, it's really embarrassing, but I've been arrested. I'm in 
I'm in Las Vegas and I'm in jail and, and they say that I need $2,500 to get out of jail. Can you, can you help me out here? Um, and you're just woken up because you're in the middle of this great dream. And, um, and you're like, oh, sure, let me, let me help you out here. How, how can I get it to you? And oh, I'll put the police officer on the phone. Put somebody on, somebody who sounds official and takes your payment information and boom, you're out $2,500. So it's called, we call it a grandparents scam. The best, the best way around this is to say, what did I get you for your fifth birthday? What was your, <laughs> what was your favorite toy? And they'll hang up, they'll go away. Um, anybody legitimate should be able to answer. It's like, oh really, so, uh, so, uh, so what do you like to do when you come to my house? Pick strawberries. <laughs> um, but they'll know, you, you, can, you can tell right away that, that this is a scam um, uh, because they're not going to have the facts straight. And they're counting on somebody going into a panic and not thinking and just reacting. Um, yep, and, and, and they're looking for money. There's uh, romance scams, uh, also known as catfishing. Uh, uh, what they'll do is they'll, they'll, they'll call you up or they'll contact you in some way and say, oh, we've got so much in common, da 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 and they're trying to spark a romance with you. And they'll spend months trying to spark this romance, and they, they, they kind of know what you're looking for in, in a partner or something, and they kind of fake that they are who they say they are. And then they'll do something like, uh, hey, I really would love to come visit, but I can't really afford it right now. Uh, can you send me $1,000? And I'll come visit. I'll be there next Tuesday. And after months of working on you, you say, sure, why not? And, and, uh, and uh, all of a sudden, the money you send them just vanishes, and, uh, and you're out. But, but they're, they, they'll, work on, they'll work on a target for months trying to get people to, to uh, give in to this kind of thing. <laughs> Home repair scams. So I've always said that. This, was, this is one of my favorite personal quotes is that with a hard hat and a clipboard, I can do anything. I can go anywhere. If I, if I, walked, in, if I walked in with a, with a hard hat and a clipboard or an official-looking uniform, say, hi, I need to go check a water meter or something like that, most people wouldn't ask any questions because I look official. If you look, if you look official, people will, will not question. Um, and you should always be on your guard. Somebody says, I need to look at your gas meter. It's like, well, we heat with oil, so go away and call the cops. <laughs> but, um, but the home repair folks will say, hey, uh, you know, so we were going past, so we're in the neighborhood. Um, uh, we we're working on a roof, you know, two doors down. But we noticed your roof needs some repair. Do you have any leaks or anything I can help you with? And, uh, and he was like, wow, hey, here's a great opportunity to get this dealt with. I've been thinking about doing this for ages. And, um, and uh, Sure, I, you know, once you go up there and take a look, they go up there and take a look and say, I can do it for 5000 and I can be back on Tuesday. Because right, it'll take me a while to get the shingles and everything. I'm going to need a deposit, and I need a deposit for $1,000 or something. But I'll be back on Tuesday, so you write a check for the 1000 bucks, and phew, you never see it again. Very, very common. Um, what they'll do is they'll, they'll identify people who look like they might need work done. People who maybe maybe have a nicely established yard or something. It's like, well, these people are probably spend their days in the yard, right? Uh, yep, take the money and run. So, so um, uh, due diligence is is the important thing here. Make sure you get recommendations. Make sure you can identify them. You can find their website. You can you can find the people down the street who they're doing work for. Uh, it's really important that you do some due diligence and <coughs> know who you're hiring before you offer any money. <coughs> Investment scams. Now, this is a good one. A lot, of this, a lot of times this happens over the phone. We'll say, hey, you know, we've got this great thing. I'm calling from Charles Schwab, and, uh, and I've got the really great deal right now, but you've got to sign up right away. Again, the sense of urgency. Um, you give them money to do this investment, and off they go with your money. Now, it gets very, very sophisticated. Remember, we were talking about spear phishing. They research their targets. They, there's also a thing called whaling, which is you not only do you research your target, but you're going after somebody with means. They've actually set up offices for these things overnight, so you don't feel comfortable doing it over the phone. Well, why don't you come into our office? We're over on 123 Main Street. And so you go to 123 Main Street, and there are people there 
with office equipment and it looks like a legitimate office, but they're trying to steal half a million dollars from you. Um, spending money on a temporary office is actually pretty easy. And this has happened all over the country where they set up an office and people come in and they say, well, this looks like a very reputable firm, so uh, they'll be put me put me down for a hundred grand or something like that. And they write the check and they walk off with a hundred grand and the next day the office is empty and they've just made a hundred thousand bucks off of you. So even if they have an office, always talk to your financial advisor, somebody who's trusting you, you trust already, and you can say, hey, I got this thing, somebody told me this, what do you think? And, and they'll be able to, to tell you whether or not it's legit or not. But never, never invest money without, without talking to a financial advisor, because there are so many scammers out there, particularly for folks who are retired and nearing retirement, they've got a nest egg and they would like to see it grow. You know, they're kind of preying on that. So how do you protect yourself from all this? We talked about some of it. Let's talk about password security. This is one of the big ones. How many people reuse passwords? They got one password, they've used in multiple places. Never, never do that. Um, because let's say, let's say for example, um, um, let's say, uh, um, let, me, let me pick something, McDonald's. Let's say you have a McDonald's account, right? So you, you have the password in McDonald's, but it's also your Facebook password, and it's also your brokerage account password, and it's also this, that, and the other thing. All it takes is one of those to be hacked, and suddenly they have your password for everything. So you need different passwords for everything. Now, you might want to do something simple, like um, uh, put an extra letter on the end of it, like, you have a password that's uh, one two three four, and for McDonald's I'm going to put the I'm going to put a capital M at the end of it, right? To because it's different, right? Or um, a capital F for Facebook. I mean that's very simplistic, but but that is a, a decent defense. What they'll do, what these scammers will do is they'll identify one password of yours, and then they've got programs that go to thousands of websites looking for that password to match. And all you need is one letter different, and it won't and they'll just move on to the next one. Um, so, so even if something as simple as adding an extra letter, unless you have a human being thinking about that and trying that, oh, maybe they put an M at the end of it for McDonald's, um, uh, it would take that to, to get through. So it's a different passwords everywhere. I use a password manager. Uh, password manager, um, I use one called Dashlane. I like Dashlane very much. Dashlane. D yeah, D-A-S-H-L-A-N-E. Now, Dashlane costs $70 a year, but it, it manages all my passwords. It has stupid long passwords. I'm talking about like 15 character passwords with all sorts of crazy things in it. It runs on Windows, Mac, iPhone, and Android, and will automatically fill in your password for you. It also monitors the dark web so that if it notices that your password was, was part of a hack, um, it will tell you and offer to change it for you, which is kind of nice. It also allows for um, a thing called two-factor authentication, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but I, I like that because it guarantees that all my passwords are different. All my passwords are completely unguessable, and it allows me the convenience of being able to have it automatically enter it for me, so I don't even need to remember my passwords anymore, which is kind of nice. Just the main one. Hmm? Just the Just main, the main one. one. The main one is the one that, uh, that that encrypts and decrypts your your password file, and um, and, and it's also protected by two-factor authentication, which I'll talk about now. Um, your banks will always have two-factor authentication. Things like Facebook offer it. Um, some some uh, Google offers it. Uh, most things offer two-factor authentication. So when you want to authenticate who you are, um, there are a couple ways to do that. One is you can show up and say, hi. And you say, I recognize you, and now you know I'm authentic because you recognize me, because I look a certain way and I talk a certain way. You know it is who I am. I am who I say I am. Um, but um, another authentication might be your, your driver's license. You go to a bank and they say, are you really you? And you hand them your driver's license and they look and they say, yep, now you're authentic. So 
two factors is necessary when you're online because they can't see who you are. You could be somebody in Timbuktu. Um, but they want to make sure that it really is you. So they're going to want your username and your password. Now your password is something you know. And then, then uh, the second factor would be something else, like a, like a magic code. Um, you've probably seen it where they, they text you a login code. They say, they say uh, 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 we just sent a, a text to your phone. Please tell us what the text said. And you punch in, you know, five, six, seven, eight, or whatever the text said. That's your second factor. That is, in addition to knowing your password, you now possess this code that's good for 30 seconds, and you enter it in. That means that even without, even if they, a bad guy had your password, they still couldn't log in because they don't have that second factor. They don't have your phone handy. They, they, can't, they can't look at that code. They can't figure out what that code is. So even if they get your password, they, they still need that extra, that extra piece of information, that text that they sent you. There's also um, pieces of hardware that you can carry around. So I've got this, I got these here. These are the little USB things. These are unique to me. So I punch in my password, then I plug it into my computer, and, uh, and, and I tap it. And it says, oh, not only does he have his password, but he also has his key fob. Now, somebody in Timbuktu is not going to have this, so they can't log into my Where account. Where did you get that? This is a, it's a thing called YubiKey. I, I wouldn't recommend it for, for people who are novices because there's not a lot of services that use it. But, but what I would recommend, though, is, um, is the, the text message um, as a second factor. It can, it can be defeated, but it's very, very difficult. I have a question. Sure. Um, through the Citizen Bank, I, I give them their password, and they've asked me uh, for, um, you know, who is your this relative or that relative, and I gave them the real information. Is that okay? You <laughs> called them, though, right? Huh? You called them? They, you know, every time you, you check in, they'll say, for your verification, you know, where, where did you live? But it's at the bank. It's oh, if it's at the bank, sure, that's yeah. fine. I mean, I. Or if they call you, or yeah. if, if you call them, mm -hmm. that's fine too. Yeah. If they call you, because uh -uh. <laughs> you don't know. If you call them, you know you're calling a legitimate place because you've got the phone number. But when I you. check in to check on my banking account, yep. yeah, they'll say not only my password, but for your security, what was certain. On your thing computer? On your computer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's fine as long as you went there on your own instead of click the link someplace. Yeah. Well, I was being honest with them there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so I did use, use your password manager and use two-factor authentication. Now, one of the cool things about Dashlane and a lot of other ones too, I'm, Dashlane just happens to be the one that I use, but they actually have that, that code built into it as well. So it'll fill in my password and it'll automatically fill in that code as well. So essentially, to log into anything that I have, you have to have my phone or my key fobs. So that eliminates the vast majority of the world trying to hack into my stuff. So Wi-Fi security. So um, um, probably not so much of an issue in Henniker, but but in a, in a big city where you've got a lot of people in a lot of places, you can turn on your phone and you can see 75 Wi-Fi's out there. Um, you want to make sure that you have a strong password on your Wi-Fi because let's say you're in an apartment building and you see 75 different Wi-Fi's there. I can guess some passwords there and there are actually techniques that I can use to find out the passwords. But it's important that you, you don't let the bad guys on your Wi-Fi network because your PC is sitting there as well. And it's possible for people to then break into your PC because they're, they're on the same network. Um, and this is why I say separate your networks if possible. If um, sometimes you'll say, oh, I, you need the Wi-Fi, and here's my password. And you give the, give the people, you know, your guests the password. You have to trust them because, because uh, they may, they could use it to hack into your computer. And your computer's where you keep your banking information, for example. Um, some of these new wireless routers have the ability to have a guest network and a um, a guest network and an internal network. 
Um, if you have that as a feature, you might want to use that. That way, you can give your guests access to the guest network, but it doesn't also give them access to your PC. So this may be something, if you don't understand how routers work, you can find somebody who does and have them set that up for you. That way, you've kind of protected yourself. <coughs> Comcast offers you a modem and a router. Yep. Together. Yes. Now, is that feasible? Or, uh, is that password protected? Typically, yeah. A lot of times on, on the, the Comcast stuff, they'll actually write down the, 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 the passwords written on the bottom of the router. Yeah. That's fairly secure. Okay. Because it's going to be tough for somebody to guess that. So other defenses, um, uh, if you see updates for your computer or your iPhone or Android, um, update quickly. Don't waste time. Uh, many times the updates that you're seeing are to fix a vulnerability that's in, the, that's in the, what you already have. And until you apply that fix, um, you're, you're potentially vulnerable and somebody can hack you. Um, so always keep your stuff up to date. And I, I try to... Um, I have it mine automatically update because I want it as quickly as possible because I don't want to walk around with vulnerabilities that was that were fixed six months ago. Um, that actually that actually bit uh, the the store chain target really hard. They weren't updating their stuff and they fell victim to um, to a hack. Um, Experian, the the credit company, uh, was hacked because they didn't have their stuff up to date. What happened is that. A vulnerability came out. People said, wow, I wonder what companies are using this broken software that haven't updated yet. And they started to go out and they hunting. And Experian not only was hacked because they didn't update it, but it took them several months to find out that they had been hacked. <coughs> Meanwhile, this was a five, six years ago or something. You probably, it was all over the news. Um, yeah, they, they didn't have stuff up to date. Um, use antivirus or anti-malware software that we talked about. This is... Um, this is the logo for Sophos that I that I like to use right here, um, and here's the logo for Dashlane. Um, I like doing backups. I like doing cloud backups. Um, basically, what it does is in the deep dark of the night, it copies all your stuff off to the cloud. So if somebody hacks your computer, or deletes your files, or encrypts your files, it's still off in the cloud someplace, and you can you can then restore it from the cloud. You can get get your stuff back. It's a pain in the butt but it's better than writing somebody a check to get it back. So do backups. And, um, and I use a thing called a VPN, which is a virtual private network. And I particularly do this when I'm in a public place. If my laptop was on the wireless here, it would be with a virtual private network. And what that does is it means the network owner can't see what you're doing. It's essentially, if you're sitting in an airport lounge, and you don't have a VPN, everybody can see what you're up to. They can see what websites you're going to. They can, they can sometimes see passwords go by. Um, a VPN is kind of like a tunnel that goes into, beyond that so that you're into the trusted area again. That ABG said that they can see where I'm going, that, that my bank account could be visible or whatever. I, I would be, I'd be very careful with that. I think that that, that may be a virus. Um, Maybe that ABG thing? Yeah. Okay. I'm not familiar with it, and I can I can Google it and see if it's legit or not. But it, it's a concern. It's a concern. It may be it may be um, what they call adware, where you install this stuff and it sits there and advertises to you to try and get you to pay up to get the ads to go away. It might not be malicious, but it doesn't sound good. So I'd be careful mm -hmm. with that. Um, what is Carbonite? Carbonite is a backup tool, and this is a, a cloud backup that you can use, and what it does is it copies all your files off to the cloud, so that if your computer gets stolen, uh, so it breaks, um, um, somebody encrypts all your files maliciously, you can go off to the cloud, to like a Carbonite or some product like that, and get all your files back. I, that, sounds, that sounds familiar to me. That's been around a long time. Right? It has, yep. Yeah. yep. Um, and there are a lot of competitors for it out there. There's a lot of, a lot of uh, companies that will do that for you. That's just one of them, and it's well known. Um, I, I'm a photographer, and, and uh, I have all my stuff backed up in like four different ways because I'm terrified of losing it, right? So I've got, 
I got it on the Adobe Cloud, I got it in the Google Cloud, I've got it in the Microsoft's Cloud, and I've got it on, on the, uh, the cloud backup that I've got. So I got like four different copies, and then it's on each of my computers as well. So I'm really a bit paranoid about losing my stuff. Um, and then use a password manager like, like Dashlane. I think that that solves a lot of problems for me. It allows me to have secure passwords everywhere, and I only have to remember one password for them all. And I have a complex password. And I have two-factor authentication, so not only do I put in my complex password, but I need to put in my second factor to be able to access that. So if somebody in Timbuktu can't, can't do that. And more other defenses. So USB sticks are a problem. Um, USB sticks, so little memory, memory sticks that you get and everything, um, you can have malware on those things. So you plug it into your computer and your computer starts, is now infected with malware. So I don't accept USB sticks from anybody, and uh, nobody should take it personally, but I don't, USB sticks are bad. I, I buy them, and I have them on a key ring, and those are the only ones that I'm gonna use. And I typically don't put them into other people's computers either, because if I put it into an infected computer now, that infection goes onto my USB stick, and it goes to my computer. Um, it's also, USB sticks are, are, are such, a, such a fun hack. Let's say, for example, that I wanted to hack into um, Hannaford. Let's say it's Hannaford, a grocery store, right? If I wanted to hack into Hannaford, I'd go to the, I'd go to the Hannaford corporate headquarters. I would infect USB sticks with a virus that I wanted, and I would buy USB sticks that look like a shopping cart or something like that, or had the Hannaford logo on it. And I would chuck them over the wall into the parking lot. Now, what happens is that Hannaford employee from corporate comes along and says, oh, Here's a Hannaford USB stick. It must belong to one of my coworkers. So they pick it up off the ground. And then they put it into their computer when they get into the office. And all they see is garbage. But I've now infected their computer. Oh. And anybody who does that, right? So you want to you hack somebody, you can say, say uh, let's say it's a car dealer. So you get a USB stick that looks like a Porsche that, where the headlights light up, right? Everybody wants one of those, right? And so what you do is you kind of overcome, overcome their defenses. Normally, if it was a boring one, they would just throw it away or just ignore it, but it's an exciting one, so they're going to want it, and they're going to plug it into their computer. Um, use disk encryption. The disk encryption um, uh, basically means that if somebody takes the, the hard, hard drive storage out of this computer and they plug it into another one, it will do them no good. They'll get nothing. It'll all be fully encrypted. Um, and I made a, I made a bunch of uh, executives go white um, during a presentation once. And I said, here we all are in the conference room. Where are your laptops? And everybody's laptops are on their desks. And I said, I said uh, while we're all here, I've got a friend who has a hard drive that looks like it goes in your laptop. And they've broken it. And they're going around and taking out a two terabyte hard drive from your computer and plugging in the broken one. Now, what are you going to see when you get back to the desk? you're going to find your computer isn't working. You're going to call service. They're going to say your hard drive is broken. They're going to give you a new hard drive. Meanwhile, I just walked away with two terabytes of unencrypted private information from this company. And they're like, oh, crap. <laughs> so, so, so yes, use, use disk encryption because um, it's all automatic. Once you set it up, you don't ever have to worry about a thing. Where do you get stuff like that? This part is built into Windows and, and Mac OS. BitLocker is part of Windows now. Hmm. So you just, you just have to turn it on. What if your computer is not upgraded to? Depends how old it is. 8.1? I don't know if BitLocker is in 8. Hmm. I know for certain it's in 10 and 12, 10 and 11. Okay. Um, I don't know about 8. Okay. Um, and lock your computer when you're away. Um, because if, if you leave your computer unlocked, people can do all kinds of things. And, and I work in the cybersecurity world, so if I see computers that are, that are unlocked, I'll go over and over. How would you find out if it has it? Hmm? How would you find out if it does have it? I would just do a Google search. Um, does Windows 8.1 have BitLocker? Okay. Yeah. So anyhow, this is the summary slide. Be skeptical of everything you see. Don't act fast. If you're, if you're reacting, you're more likely to fall victim. Um, 
if you need help, ask for help from people you trust. Don't, don't get help from the person calling on the phone or offering you help online. And this is one of my favorites. And if you find yourself in a hole, for God's sake, stop digging. If something's happened and, and your computer's messed up, maybe you've got a virus or something like that, just, just stop where you are, find an expert who can help you work through it. Do not accept help from people online because it might have been the person online who screwed you up to begin with, only to put you into a place where you're vulnerable. So. Good thought. <laughs> And that's it. And we've got, a, I guess I was a, sat down. one minute late. I, I don't even know we sat down. Very good. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. And I'm happy to chat if you guys have any further questions. I wasn't laughing.